Kristen. I hope everybody has had a wonderful last couple of weeks. Um, in the last two weeks, I ran two different black lighting events here in the Philadelphia region, one over at Silver Lake Nature Center and another one at Pennypack on the Delaware. And then um, flew to Arizona and I hung out there for five days, five-ish, five-ish days. Um, and got to go to an insect conference with entomologists and other bug lovers from all over the country and that's always a really great time. I absolutely love going. And so I am here with you this week, um, this Thursday and Sunday, and then I think I will be gone for approximately another two weeks because I'm going to be heading up to Michigan for a handful of weddings. Um, everybody wanted to get married at the same in the same couple of weeks, but that's good. It makes it all one trip. Anyway, so um, that's what I have been up to. I hope that you all have been doing great. I posted something like a hundred and fifty pictures from my trip onto Facebook, and I'm gonna have to make sure that they are also posted. To, I thought that I posted them to Insectopia, but now I'm thinking I might have to share my post over. That's fine. Uh, there are lots of images to be seen. Um, I, all They're already all posted to iNaturalist, but anyways. All right, I hope that we are all doing swell. I know I had Susan here chatting with me a little bit earlier, um, but I haven't been seeing any more chats come in, so I hope that the chat box is doing all right. It had this weird little glitch a little earlier. Oh, hi, Jody. All right, perfect. Hello. Awesome. Yay, thank you, ladies, letting me know that the chat, bo chat box worked. Um, I have been reading Ant Hill by E.O. Wilson, so I super appreciate that. And I have... Um, I was able to read it a little bit on the plane flying to and from my bug conference in Arizona um, and a couple of people recognized it so I'm not far enough in to give you know um, too many thought processes yet I'm still really just enjoying the book so it is good to see everybody again true story it's been a minute um, but now we are all back we're ready to go um, this insect Yes, it is a fun book. All right, so this insect that we have underneath the microscope today is the family is Bellostomatidae. I have that written on the board, but I can change that. Oops. I can change that to giant water bug, right? That's going to be another one of the common names for this insect. Um, it's really a common name for the entire family of insects because there are some that are very, very large that are equivalent to the length of your palm. Um, and those are in a genus we call Lithoceros. And those are really amazing. They're this huge genus and they're, you know, three inches large. They're crazy. This one that we're looking at today is not a Lithoceros. It's significantly small, smaller. Sorry, talking and typing at the same time doesn't always work very well. I do it well sometimes. So this is a Betis. Um, I'm not exactly sure what species we are looking at, but I do know the genus, which is great. Um, Abetus is a kind of a fun genus because if you have ever heard, let's see, I'm trying to see if we can get this camera to focus well closely, maybe this way. Yeah, very good. All right, so this genus, um, the females will lay their eggs on the male's backs, all right? So Terry we have here, um, the females will actually glue their eggs to the tegmina or to the first pair of wings of the males. And then the males are the ones that are required to carry around the eggs and to make sure that they're safe. 
And the males always then have to stay on the move, uh, or at least on the move most of the time, because the eggs need the circulation of the water or they'll drown. So it's the male's responsibility to care for the eggs after the ladies lay them. And I always thought that that's a cool little story in insects, because you don't hear that very regularly, that the males have to care for um, a piece of what they've helped create. So that is fun. Oh, look at it. Hi, Marley. Welcome. Yay, you made it. Oh, that's so exciting. All right. So that's my, that's my fun story about a beetus. And so that's this genus. Um, and I believe at some point I actually did have a picture of the female's eggs on their backs. I don't know if that's still around. I would really have to look for it. Man, typing and writing today is not one of my strong suits. Or typing and talking. All right, so Bellastomatidae is our family, and so I'm going to go ahead and write that, mm, that down. Maybe I'll just do giant water bug and a beetus. Uh, while it's under the microscope, we might as well go ahead and get some measurements taken care of. For those of you who are nature journaling, I know that your measurements are pretty important. Just to make sure that everything is por proportioned out. So I'm going to say it's definitely under three centimeters. My bug is type, type uh, kind of um, angled, so it's hard to get a full read. But I'm guessing it's somewhere in like the 2.8, 2.9 centimeters range. Somewhere in there, 2.8. We're going to call it 2.8. We'll call it a little under. And if we were going to just give our insect a little overview before we got started. Oh, hey, I put that pretty well, almost exactly where it belonged. Hi, Chaos. Oh, it's been so long since everyone's been together. It makes me so happy to see everyone. And I love that we're doing a venomous insect, right? Giant water bugs do have venom. Whatever they attack, they'll inject venom into. They liquefy their prey, and then they drink them. Um, so that's kind of cool. You're looking at here is these first pair of wings. Um, they're not a beetles. Beetles have elytra. We call these tagmina. No, we would call these hemielytra because they're a true bug. But they're not really half seas. Quite interesting. All right, so that's going to be our overall of the top side. The bottom side is really where this insect gets interesting. So I did want to kind of scroll through him a little bit before we started sketching him. Let's see. Yes, the wing textures are great. Um. <laughs> That's the ideal. You'll never catch up. Ba ha 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 ha. Chaos. <laughs> That's fine. Pick and choose the ones you enjoy. You know, they might not all be for you. We do a lot of variety in insects, you know? Um, so this is the bottom of our insect. This is the bottom of our giant water bug. If Terry comes and helps us out. Um, up here, this is our compound eyes are right about here. And this is the mouth part. So you can see there's almost this like little straw and it goes into what looks like um, a bigger sheath. That is the case. So this little straw is the mouth part, but they've got this big sheath that's kind of like um, a hollow thumbtack. And they just kind of stab that into their prey animal, and then their mouth part then is inside of it. So that's how they're going to drink their prey. Uh, we could zoom in on that if you guys want. It is kind of cool. Forbidden snoot. I love it. Yep, they're called the forbidden snoot from now on. Um, this is... 
They are sometimes called toe biters, is another one of their common names. Oh, look at how beautiful that picture is. Sometimes I love it too. So right here, you can see that little itty bitty tube. That's the mouth part. That's the little straw tube. And this on the outside that you can kind of see it going into, that's the sheath that protects the, um, that protects the mouth part. And it goes all the way over to the end. All right, so I'm going to zoom out again, and we're going to look at just the bottom of the legs really quick. Um, this first pair of legs, we say it's raptorial. Um, we say that these first pair of legs are raptorial. That just means that they're grabbing legs, kind of like a praying mantis legs. So if you imagine how a praying mantis kind of grabs a butterfly or a moth and kind of holds on to it, um, that's the same thing giant water bugs are going to do. They're going to grab onto their prey and hold on to them. I actually, I had a pet giant water bug. All right, you guys can actually tell me if this is okay to share. Um, I have a giant water bug as a pet, and every now and again I feed it fish. Um, because that's one of the things that it would eat naturally in the wild. Um, so I was feeding it a fish one time, and I was recording it um, feeding. And the interesting thing about these giant water bugs is that they really prefer to inject their venom or to drink in like the softer areas of the fish. And so I got a video of it piercing into a fish's eyeball and drinking from his eye. And I just thought that that was really awesome and both kind of creepy. And I haven't shared it with anyone yet because I wasn't sure if people would be offended because it was a fish. So, you got to tell me. Yeah, let me know if you think that it would be okay for me to share that video with the world. So, we've got the underside of my Bella Stomatid, right? Um, we're looking right about here is what we would consider the coxy or those um, kind of the hip bones. And sometimes we talk about this joint and sometimes we don't. And in giant water bugs, they are giant when you look at them from the bottom. It's essentially the giant water bug's knees. Um, it's this angled piece right here, but it's called a trochanter. That's super creepy, but I love it. People get offended. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, people sometimes will get offended by invertebrates eating vertebrates, and so that's why I wasn't sure if I wanted to share it, but it is something that happens naturally in the wild. Um, you saw my, fo my scorpion photo. Awesome. Maybe I'll share the whole album of Arizona insects on the uh, nature journaling page. What do you think? You think that people would be interested in seeing like my whole folder of bug pictures from Arizona? And so we're looking at the back of the abdomen. I want to flip it over and really start sketching. I just wanted to give us an overview of what our friend looked like and to talk about it a little bit before we really got going. You're talking about the giant water bugs, right? So yes, the giant water bugs have wings and can fly. Oh, yay! It looks like, yes, 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 I've got to post my bug pictures on the um, nature journaling page. So I will go ahead and do that for you. And I'll make sure to add the, uh, the names of everything so that you have those on your reports. I haven't gone through and tagged them all yet on Facebook. Awesome. So, giant... water bugs. 
Um, so we're doing giant water bugs, and this one specifically that we're doing is an abetus species. So I'm just gonna write abetus on mine, and I'm gonna go ahead and write it right here so that you know how to spell it. So that is A B E D U S abetus. And um, for those of you who don't know, the SP at the end just means species, essentially. So, um, Abetus is the genus, but we don't know the species name of this one in particular, so we just write SP. But we know that it is one species, because it's only one single individual. If I had a big pile of Abetus, I had a bunch of them, but I wasn't sure if there were one species or multiple species, then I would put SPP. And that just means one or many species. Susan, I've got the genus on the board for you now. Abetus species. Um, I don't. I didn't identify it all the way down yet, but that's pretty close. They're also. I also collected it in Arizona. All right. So I always start when I'm sketching with the head. We're looking right about up here. Um, I'm looking at this beautiful kind of wavy M shape. And I'm thinking that when I start my sketch, I'm just going to make it a straight line um, so that when I do add the curves, I can add them and make sure that they're even. So what I'm going to do is I'm essentially just going to imagine this as kind of a flat D and then add the extension on the head. And I think that's how I'm going to get my shape for, you know, my basic outline before I start erasing and finalizing lines here. So we've got a head and we've got the two compound eyes and the what looks like an extension of the head. Let's see. So if you'll notice around all of the edges where our, our specimen looks very light colored, um, that is mostly because he was covered in sediment, and not that he is naturally that texture. He's just a dirty specimen. Um, and I honestly, I thought about putting him on top of a dark paper rather than a light paper. Um, let's see if this change, how much this changes. Ooh, don't touch the bug. He's fine. Everything's okay. I think that this is going to be better. So I'm going to take a minute to pin this darker paper down into my styrofoam so that it doesn't mess with our... I don't want it to hurt the specimen. So... But I think that this will be better. It reminds you of an archaeological artifact. Yes, exactly. And if I was to show you the image of the little pond place that I picked it up from, you would totally understand. Um, this was a specimen collected in Arizona. And I'll tell you a little bit about... Actually... This specimen was collected in 2021, um, the year that Akshay joined us at the IECC, at um, the conference. And if any of you have followed or watched um, some of Akshay's uh, sketches, in his book, he has like a little half page devoted to a giant water bug. That was this individual here. Um, he took it and nature journaled from it when it was alive before it was one of my specimens. So that's kind of a funny connection between you guys. All right, I'm getting close.
close to getting the um, the head taken care of here. I think that my the center of my head is just a little bit too high and I keep messing with it a little bit. Oh, that's going to be much better. Yeah. Something closer to that. All right. And then our pronotum is this next section right here. So I'll go ahead and write this word for everybody. We call this the pronotum, and this is this rectangular box here. It's also the first segment of the thorax. All right, so this is the first segment of the thorax. It's where the first pair of legs are connected onto, and the first pair of wings are connected to the back of it. All right, so all of those things are happening right here at the pronotum. Um, we have pretty much every insect that we've that we've sketched and looked at um, had a um, had a visible pronotum. Some of them are a little bit less, but most insects you'll see they have a visible or even a shield-like pronotum. I'm gonna see if I can add this curved line in here. Maybe I'll wait. I really wanted to get it in there. I think I'm going to wait. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get the pronotum in here that is gets a little wider at the base, but it's not too much. All right, and then when we're moving down from here, we have the scutellum, which is... Yeah, which is this triangle right here. I'm going to go ahead and move our specimen a little bit. Yeah, he's got a little itty bitty head. So this right here is our scutellum. That's this little triangle in between the wings. Um, because this insect is in the order Hemiptera, we consider it a true bug. All right. So anything that's actually a true bug is a type of insect that has a piercing and sucking mouth part. There are both predatory true bugs and plant feeding true bugs. So the fact that its mouth part pierces and sucks doesn't mean that it's always venomous and it doesn't mean it always can bite people. Um, other examples of non-biting slash stinging true bugs would be aphids, um, cicadas, stink bugs. Those are all considered true bugs that also feed on plant material. Um, and they have these front wings that we call hemiolytra. It means that they're half leathery and half membranous on the very end. So if we're looking at them from up above, these are wings are kind of leathery looking. And you should see they have this really awesome texture too. So when you, if you were to spread these wings, um, you couldn't really see through them at all. Um, I would almost argue that the wing, it feels more like a praying mantis or a grasshopper wing than anything else, but they are a true bug. So I guess they're kind of pre-required to have hemiolytra rather than tegmina. Um, and then you've got the end where they kind of connect to one another. All right, so now that we've gotten that little bit of an overview, I'm going to turn my camera back on over here and I'm going to sketch the overall shape of the wings and abdomen here. So it does come, and I'll pull my specimen in this direction. He does come and get fairly wide at the ends here and here, and then he narrows back down. So if you take this angle that you've already got on your pronotum and pull it and just continue it out for, for a little bit and then come back in, you're going to have your overall body shape.
So that'll give you kind of your rough shape for your insect. And as we add on, we're going to do things like add this triangle, this scutellum to the center of our true bug, and then maybe give it this line all the way down. Um, true bugs, let's see. True bugs. Uh, their wings don't meet in the center evenly like a beetle's would. So if you are looking at the, if you're, these guys are pretty even. But normally, let's just say normally true bugs, instead of meeting center and doing a single line like this, a lot of times one will overlap the other one and, um... And so you'll have kind of an angled line that's asymmetrical. In this specimen, it actually looks like they meet central. So I'm going to go ahead and straighten that line out. Made an assumption without looking up at the microscope. There we go. All right, let's zoom in on the head and check out some um, textures and talk about eyes. Oops. Sometimes I just zoom too far in. I get so excited. I go zoom, zoom, and then it's way up here. But I kind of do want to get close to the eye and see what I can see. Sometimes I consider looking over the insects first and kind of planning these out, but I also like to be surprised with you folks. Um, so something that I'm noticing here is this left eye looks a little bit cleaner than the right eye. Um, I can't imagine trying to look through like this area of your eye where it's got all of this gunk and sand around, but it looks like you can see the individual lenses. So if any of you do um, zoom in sketches, those are our eyes. You can see our compound eye actually does kind of come down to a D um, shape down here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change my sketch just a little bit. And I'm going to make sure that it kind of comes down and then there's this angle here. So that um, I also have the, um, the shape of the head coming up. That works for me. And so that, I think, is actually going to make my specimen look a lot more realistic, too. So, happy about that. How many of you have seen a giant water bug in real life? How many of you have seen, seen one of these guys before? Any hairs between the... Um... These aren't technically called ocelli. They're called Oh man, what are they called? Don't mind me, I'm cheating really quick. I have forgotten. They're called omatidia. Um so uh an ocelli is a simple eye and a lot of times those are separate from the compound eye so things like wasps some wasps will have three ocelli in the center of their head um giant water bugs don't have simple eyes they don't have ocelli they do have these compound eyes and um if you want to talk about one of some of the individual cells those individual eyes on the compound eye those are what we call omatidia. Susan's got it. Yeah, there's a fancy word for them. Thank you. Does it have special adaptations for living under the water? Yes, it does. Um, on its, let me, um, let me, uh, I'm going to get zoomed out, focused on our next spot, and I will tell you about their adaptations for underwater. 
I want to get us refocused to the pronotum so that we can add any of the detail, the shapes, and the design that people would like. Let's see. There we go. Turn off Terry. Hi, Terry. There we go. All right, so um, giant water bugs do have adaptations for living underwater. First thing is their hind legs are adapted for swimming. A lot of times they will have either long hairs on the ends of their tibia or kind of flat angled legs that they can use kind of like oars to push the water around them. And so, yes, they're going to have swimming legs. A lot of times, those are on the hind legs. Uh, they also have a specialized breathing system, right? Because insects that live underwater are definitely not just going to be able to open up spiracles like any other insect would and just breathe natural air, right? So I'm going through and I'm finalizing some of these lines in here, making sure that my pronotum is all situated. I want to make sure that this eye gets fixed. Um, so they can't breathe. They can't breathe naturally. But what they can do is at the very, very end of their abdomen, they have spiracles here. And um, we might actually be able to turn it over and look at it. Um, but giant water bugs will naturally kind of hang from the surface of the water. So if I had the surface like this, their abdomen is going to be facing up and their head kind of faces down. And that's helpful for them because they also have these predatory front legs. So if a fish swims underneath them or a dragonfly larva swims underneath them, they can just kind of dive down, catch it, and come back up to the surface. Because they can hold air underneath their wings, but they can't breathe underwater like a lot of other insects can. Um, a lot of other insects have gills or the ability to breathe through plants or other adaptations that help them breathe underwater. These guys just have to break the water surface and hang out on the top. It always comes back to their bug butts. Yep. Well, I mean, bug butts are very important, okay? So I'm going to add a couple of these designs that are on the pronotum that I find are, are significant. And that would be, I, I'm looking at kind of these two loops right here and here that have caught sand in the center of them. I think that they're kind of fun looking. There's also this very interesting, I think, kind of darker center line that I might add in just a little bit. And then this ridge here that's parallel to the bottom. So those are the uh, those are the features that I'm adding on to my friend here. But if you see other features that you're interested in adding, I would say go ahead. Um, I might even add, do you see how there's the edge of the pronotum is ribbed? kind of all the way around. I might go through and add a second rib all the way around the pronotum. I think this will look good. And I also think that that's going to be realistic to our character, to our specimen. It's got a very ribbed pronotum. Let's see. Are microbial films something aquatic species have? Ah, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Microbial. I know that... I know that there are a significant number of insects that feed on microbial films. Um, we'll call them we'll call them grazers a lot of times if they're feeding off of the top layer. Um, sometimes we'll call them shredders if it's a microbial layer that's kind of on a leaf that's breaking down in the water column. I actually
actually did a video about this. I did a video on the, um, it's essentially like the aquatic underwater jobs of aquatic insects. So there are shredders that take the big pieces and break them down into small pieces. There are the grazers that kind of graze off of the surface of things, including those microbial films. Um, there are collectors that go around and they collect stuff from the bottom of the river or collect like like pieces of dead things and stuff. And then we've got filterers. And the filterers filter really, really fine, they call it fine particulate organic material. F, they call it F-POM. Um, but it's just like little fine material that's floating around in the water, like little bits of algae and little bits of green stuff. And I could talk all day long about caddisflies and their little nets. I think they're really cute. Oh, good. I'm glad you guys saw it and enjoyed it. I honestly, I need to get better at posting more of those vid videos. I just find that I'm so busy that I don't know when that I when I would have time. And I know people say you never have times for things that you don't make time for. Um, but that's something that I need to do better with. And I feel like... I feel like I'm not the only person out there that, you know, I have a lot of things that I want to do and just can't always get them all done. All right, so I like the outer, I like the outline of this guy. I might bring these corners down a little bit. I don't want them too sharp. I just wanted it to be obvious that he had this really cool kind of wider body shape. Um, and then here we have the scutellum that's this smaller triangle, this one right here. But then we also have this interesting kind of wing venation up here on top that I do want to add because I think it makes him look like he's wearing a, like a tux, like a suit jacket with the lines. I don't know. I feel like if I gave him a bow tie right about here, um, he would be ready for a ball. And you're allowed to tell me that I'm crazy and that you don't believe and that, and that you don't think the same, but. He is dapper! Yes, Susan, that's a great word for him. He is covered in dirt and still so dapper. <laughs> so, what is the function of the scutellum usually? I don't know if the scutellum has a function or if it's just the name for a body part. I could say normally it's on the top of the second segment of the thorax. Underneath the scutellum there's a lot of muscles happening because you've got the connections to all of the wings and the connections to all of the legs all happening right there in that little area. But the scutellum itself, I think, is just a name that we give this body part in between the wings. Um, in flies, it's a little bit different because if you look at kind of the side of a fly, the scutellum is kind of tucked under one of the other body parts. Um, and sometimes the identifying characteristic is down there on that, on that piece. Um... But I'm not sure if it has a, a, a normal function. In stink bugs, I would say that it almost protects the wings sometimes. Because in this one, it's kind of flat, so it doesn't protect the wings as much. But if I was thinking about a stink bug that has a larger scutellum that's kind of a wider triangle, the wings tuck right up and underneath the scutellum sometimes. So I would say it almost protects the wings sometimes. Um, if I was to give it a function. 
All right, so I'm going to scoot our microscope specimen down. Because I want to see where these, where his lapels end. All right, so it looks like the lapels are ending right about at the widest point in our specimen. So this right about here is the widest point before he starts getting narrow, and it looks like it right about lines up to that. So when I come in, I'm going to imagine this horizontal line right about here. I'm going to give myself <laughs> this line horizontal that vertical line and then I'm gonna take the angles from the corners and bring it down to let's say right about there I'm pretty happy with that I hope your sketches are also going well, going smoothly. And for those of you who are trying to get all of this texture and all of this wing venation in, that's amazing. Um, I would, if I was starting this, I would do these longer ones first and then kind of add these, um, add these little cells in afterwards because I feel like the little cells aren't as important as some of these main veins like looks like one two that are close to each other and then a third one that's kind of internal so if you were going to I would say kind of like one and then two and then the third one would be kind of internal at this angle and then you would go through and add all of those kind of octagon textured shapes in here. And uh, yeah, definitely looks like he's been buried in sand. But here's the thing. This year, um, there were a lot of rains and he wasn't even in a real water body. He was in a little like... It wasn't even a pond. It was just, I guess, a puddle in the parking lot. Um, there was this little puddle, and it was probably, I guess, like 10 feet wide. So it was a decent-sized puddle, but it wasn't like a lake or a pond, and it didn't have any plant life in it. It was just water and dirt, and this uh, giant water bug was hanging out in it. He was so happy to be in Arizona and to have water that it didn't matter that it was only like two inches deep and um, there wasn't any food in it. <laughs> oh man, I laughed about it a little bit, but there were actually a couple of them. And so when they're, um, when they're flying around and looking for places to mate and the like, um, they will land in smaller water bodies to lay their eggs and move on. They'll, like, go to multiple water bodies. I'm just making little squares in there now. Um, all right, so we've got the top done a lot of. Um, I think we can... I want to add the legs... I want to add one set of legs onto this. Even though we can't see the legs super obvious from the top, I do know that if you're looking at a specimen, you can see parts of the legs. Um, the femur and the tibia come out here. Um, femur, tibia, and then the hind leg will come out about there. So I think that, I think we will be able to make that work. Let's see. I haven't looked at the chat box. Give me a minute. Um, would it be analogous to the area between the human scapula? Yes. Kind of. I mean, that is a, um, so I'm reading this question from Deb. Would the scutellum be an an analogous to the area between the human scapula? All right, so I'm thinking about between our shoulder blades, and 
I mean, if you were considering an insect as a humanoid type creature, right? If our wings came out of our shoulder blades, then yes, that would be about the right placement of what we would consider to be our scutellum. But the thing with humans is that we have arms and legs and bones and muscles, um, and there are like contiguous they're all over the place, right? They help us move pretty much everything. The, with insects, it's a little bit different in that most of their musculature is right there in their thorax because all six of their legs are connected there. All four of their wings are connected there, right? They still need lots of muscles in their head and to move their antenna and things like that um, and to hold themselves together. But the majority of like the strength muscles that are doing work, that are doing jobs, are right there in the thorax. Um, which is why that's also where the pin goes in our specimens. Because um, where the pin goes, then the muscles, when the specimen dries, it, they tighten up and they hold the pin best. If you accidentally pin too low and you pin through the abdomen, there's not enough muscles in the bot in the body. There's not enough muscles in the abdomen to hold on to the pin. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it's so important for entomologists to get the pin in the correct location too, um, because you want to make sure that it's going to stay there for a long time. To flip my guy over, I can't use the blue background because the blue background is not prepped to take on the head of the pins. So I'm going to take the blue background off. We've got white again. Snag it in there. And so we'll be able to see the bottom, but I'm only going to be drawing what you could, in theory, see from the top. So I'll be talking you through what exactly that looks like. And you see how the tibia fits so beautifully and so well into the femur here? So right about here, you have our front pair of legs. This is the femur coming out and the tibia coming back towards it. And it fits like a glove, right? There's even that little groove for it to fit into. And that's one of the ways that you have so much strength in that, um, I never changed the word omatidia. Let's change it to raptorial. Um, because we're looking at a raptorial front leg, right? You've got so much strength in this grabbing front leg. Now, um, I'm going to act like, so at rest, if my giant water bug is not hungry and it's just hanging out, just chilling, it'll look like this. But if your water bug is hunting, it will open up its legs and hang upside down from the water. So it will look, if, if I drew this upside down, the legs will come out here and they'll come back here, kind of like this. And they hang from the surface, kind of with their legs dangling like that, so that they can help grab onto their food. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and give my giant water bug those same legs. So I'm going to do both sides on the front and then only the right side going down for the middle and the hind. Because I'm a rebel. All right, so our femur, you notice there's not really a lot of hair. Um, let's see. There's not really a lot of hair or um, CD on our front pair of legs. They're not really for, um, they're not really for swimming at all. They're mostly adapted for grabbing and holding on to prey. And then this front one is almost sharp. It's very, very pointed at the top. Something like that. And I might, I'm going to make my femur even wider because I want to make sure that the femur looks powerful enough um, to hold something. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, it needed to be, it just needed to be wider. My giant water bug said, make me powerful. Don't mind me. <laughs> it's getting late. 
<clears throat> Ooh, can we get a side view on that mouth part? Of course we can. Can you scoot Doom to the bottom of the wings? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that one. We can do that right now. Doop, 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 doop. All right, so this is what the uh, the bottom of the wings looks like. I'm sorry that I missed your comment, Susan. And so the ends of the wings are kind of rounded here and here. I guess I can make sure mine's all rounded out. And it looks like I might be able to zoom in. Yeah, I will move, Aisha, I'm sorry. I will move back up to the front leg. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss out. I, uh, I didn't want to go out of order. Haha. -ha. We will come back. <clears throat> we will get the leg situated, situation figured out. This is cool. All right, so if you look at the end right here, you can see how there's kind of this left flap right here and this right flap right here. The water, how this insect breathes, the spiracle is right there in between those two kind of flat parts on the abdomen. And I'm not sure what the names of these are called, but um, there's a spiracle in there somewhere, which is a hole that, that feeds the oxygen to the rest of the body, which is awesome. Um, so that is how my insect breathes, and it's on the end of this abdomen. So, Susanna, hopefully you have now seen and were able to sketch out a little bit of our specimen here. Feel free to take a screenshot if you need it. Um, and then we're going to go and look at the front pair of legs. And I think we're going to look at them from the side because then I might be able to describe a little better what we are looking at. And then we'll be able to turn the specimen and look at the lateral of the mouth parts too. So this is the front leg. Um, this right here is the femur. So you can see that when I had originally sketched mine, I made it kind of too thin and then I reimagined it because it's very wide. The femur is, is wide and strong. Um, and then this is kind of the joint and this right here that comes down is the part that we call the tibia is right here. And so if you imagine it like a human leg, between your hip and your knee is your femur. And then between your knee and your ankle is your tibia. And those are the same words for an insect. So for the two major parts of their legs, we've got the femur up here and the tibia down here. So that's generally how insect leg works. friend show me your mouth I don't know how much of a lateral view we're gonna be able to get of the mouth because the legs are in the way but we're gonna try really hard all right this is as good as we've got and someone said it reminded them <laughs> Susan, you got flagged for using a bad word. No, you're good. I allowed the comment. Um, so right here, this is going to be our head. This is our compound eye. The head kind of has this swoopy bird kind of shape. It almost looks like a bird beak that's kind of cut off. And then you've got this right here. And if I zoom to change focus just a little bit down, you'll see right about here, that's where you can see this straw part of the mouth entering the sheath part of the mouth.
Right there. Oh, that's such a cool shot. I love it. All right, so if we were looking at the leg from this angle, this big one in the back, that's the femur, and this one that's coming back in this direction is the tibia. So it's almost like he's kind of folded his leg in on himself like this. But when he's um, hunting, he'll kind of, oh, he's folded him like this. That'll be easier. Um, but when he's hunting, he'll kind of open them out a little bit. And so that's why on my sketch, I was just, um... I was just trying to open them up a little bit so he looked more like he was hunting and less like he was just sitting in the water waiting for food. But I do need to make sure that his femurs stay nice and large so I might even enlarge this one. Yeah. So we've got those raptorial or grabbing front legs. I'm just going to change his name up here to Giant Waterbug and leave it alone for a while. Alright, so we have two more pairs of legs to look at and to consider. If you are one of those out there who are drawing this from all of the different angles, I can still go ahead and give you the scientific names of the parts that I'm not going to draw. Um, so, actually I'm going to write them in order in the chat. All right, so I wrote them in the chat, um, and you can re refer to that for um, for spelling and stuff, so I don't have to change it over and over. Um, bye, Marley. Yes, I look forward to seeing you next week. I hope that you have stay buggy. All right, so um, this is our coxie here, that like hip bone. Our trochanter right about here is kind of that knee the femur, the tibia, and we do have tarsal segments. Um, I didn't write tarsi on the list, so tarsi is spelled like this. All right, so um, from the top, all that we're going to see are the femur and the tibia, and maybe a couple of the tarsal segments. And then if we look at the hind legs, the format of the leg is very similar. So we've got that coxal segment, the trochanter that's kind of like the knee, the femur, the really long tibia, and then if you look at the very end, I think we have, yeah, two tarsal segments and a claw. We call it the tarsal claw. Let's see. Focus, focus, focus. I need some like magic word that autofocuses the microscope. Oh, you're not seeing the list of of my All right, I'll go ahead and write them. Are right, you found it? Good. I'm glad. And that looks like our tarsal claw. And I was trying to decide if there were two claws or more than two. It's just two claws. So there's one off to the left and there's one off to the right. And it looks like there's some darker areas in the center, but those are not claws. They're just like areas that are wore down, it looks like. Cool. <sighs> I'm going to make sure that my compound eyes are checkered. That always makes it me that it makes me it makes me uh it makes me feel good when they are checkered. All right. 
So, moving up, I'm going to put... Our femur is going to be angled up a little bit. And then our, our tibia is going to be angled down. And keep in mind that this isn't the whole length of the femur either. Um, this is going to be just the part of the femur that you can see from the edge of the body. Um, this is as far zoomed out as I can get, but this is the femur right here and then the tibia coming down. I just want to make sure you can see the body part that we're sketching. <laughs> All right, so that's going to be kind of like the end of our femur. And notice that it does get wider towards the base. So just make sure that it kind of gets a little bit more narrow towards the tip to, to show that. And then we've got our tibia. And the tibia is going to be coming down. Um, and it starts a little bit narrow and gets kind of wider. There are two tarsal segments at the end of this. And those are going to be kind of stacked on one another, but also more narrow than the tibia. Um, and then at the end of your second tarsal segment, you've got the two little claws. And our hind leg is going to be very similar. Now we talked about how the hind leg can kind of have these flat surfaces that kind of make it look like an oar. And if we look at this leg, you can see that it, it is very kind of oar shaped. And it also has, if I was to cut it like through and just look at its shape, it would be triangular in shape. So um, that's going to help break the water um, with a point and then swoosh back. So it really is a pretty advanced oar type of leg. Um, and swimming legs, ew, I think this is a new word for everybody. I don't think I've brought this word up before. So raptorial, you know, is a grabbing leg, but swimming legs also have their own word. We call them natatorial. Um, that's the word for a swimming leg. So you can say that it is a natatorial leg, this hind leg. Yeah, Vea, you got it. I always remember it because um, nadar, N-A-D-A-R, is to swim in Espanol. And so that's how I remember natatorial. So my entire hind leg is not going to fit onto my paper because it just wants to go off. But I've got the femur coming out of the back area. But now you'll say, hey, that looks like it's coming off of the abdomen. Well, in fact, it is coming off of the thorax. It's just that you see the thorax kind of protrudes a little bit over top of the abdomen. I would say the abdomen starts right about here, right? Because there's a segment here, a segment here. By the time you get to this segment, that's the third abdominal segment. Um, but the coxal segment, this hip bone segment, kind of protrudes past where the abdomen starts. Still technically connected to the thorax. It's just a little off center. And I'm going to guess that that is an adaptation that was beneficial for the swimming process. Although I don't have any science to back that one up. I'm not sure about it. But that would definitely be my guess. All right, so we've got some legs taken care of. We've got... We got the mouth, we got to flip it over, we got to talk about all of the fun giant water bug stuff, including the fact that they have butt snorkels and the fact that the ladies get to lay the eggs on the males, which is super awesome. Um, this is in the genus Abetus. Is there... Ha! Jinx! Nadar is to swim! <laughs> yes, Susan, I love that. 
Is there a name for that plate that the coxa comes out of? Can you see my whole drawing? Yeah, I just have to move it up to my ca face camera. So this is my sketch as a whole. Um, maybe if I do it, oh, that's still too zoomed in. That's really close though. Look at that. All right. Um, I guess this is the best way to do it. So this is my whole sketch. When I first started sketching with you ladies and gentlemen, I was writing all of the words on my sketches and I really enjoyed that and I look, like looking back through it. But I also think that writing the words on the screen over there is probably more helpful and is easier to read. Um, plus, then I might be able to turn these into stickers or a coloring book. I've been considering both. Now that's a giant water bug, right? It's the size of my face. Um, so no, there's no species of giant water bug that is that big. Um, now, is there a name for the plate that the coxa comes out of? It comes out of the metasternum. Um, so if you were talking about the underside <laughs> Let's level up. <laughs> so we have previously talked about pro, about pro, meso, and meta, right? The pro notum is the first segment. Meso is going to be middle and meta is going to be end. We can say pro legs, meso legs, meta legs. We can call them mid legs or hind legs. There's all types of fun terminology. But if we are looking right about here, these are that's the coxal segments, that's the hips. But if we want to know what this segment is, this one that kind of the coxae are connected to, that is called the metasternum. And it goes all the way from one edge to the other edge, but it's always the bottom. Because if you think that this is our sternum in here somewhere, there's a sternum. Um, then it's kind of the same with insects. This bottom area is all, these are called sternites and the abdomen. This is the metasternum or the third segment of the thorax on the bottom. You can also say the mesosternum is where the mesocoxy come out of. And then the prosternum is where the procoxy come out of. You don't have to go all meta about it. Oh, <laughs> meta sort of, I get it. I'm like, did I do something wrong? No, I, I understand now. Your grandnephew would love a coloring book. Maybe I will put together, I, I think it would be cool to put together a co coloring book of all of my sketches and then I can learn to color them too. Um, that was my other thought process is, hey, if I had these printed into a, some type of coloring book, I could, you know, offer them to people and practice coloring my own sketches. Um, no hairs. Do you mean no hairs anywhere on its body? that I can see. If I look, I, I just took a, I just took a minute to kind of scan the entire body a little bit. Sometimes I won't turn on the microscope because when I look through the microscope, it'll be in focus for me, but not in focus for the camera. My eyes are different, have a different focus than the camera. Um, so I just went through and looked at a little bit and I am not seeing any hair. Um, maybe, there is a 
a part of me that feels like right here on the hind leg right there so right here on the hind leg on this angle so that angle is all sediment and dirt but you see how there are these individual little lines I would almost argue that those little hairs are hairs on the hind leg to help with the swimming, to help with the oar motion. A lot of um, a lot of natatorial or swimming legs will have lots of hair on the tibia, and I wasn't seeing them when we zoomed in last time. But if we zoom in really close, I would argue that those are very small, fine hairs in the hind leg. So if you were looking at it as a triangle kind of on this lower edge here, it has a series of hairs back and forth. Um, those probably open up in the water, but then lay back down when they are terrestrial. Um, could the hairs cause drag? I mean, I feel like it's possible for the hairs to cause some drag, but I think that they are mostly for swimming. If, I want to say that the hairs are probably hydrophobic, but it's a giant water bug, so I'm not sure. I think that the diving beetles have hydrophobic hairs on their legs, meaning that they, um, that they're covered in like a little oxygen bubble, but also it really helps them create this larger paddle area and push with. Um, so those are helpful hairs, um, whereas I'm not really sure about these ones. They're good questions, Deb. I would definitely look it up, but, um, yeah, for the most part, this insect is smooth and sleek and ready to fly or swim. Really, or both. All right. So, as always... Doop! Yay! All right. So as always, um, thank you for hanging out with me. I think this page, you can see my sketch even better. So that's my giant water bug, my abetus. Um, I may give it, you know, its other legs. We'll see what happens. Um, I really enjoy hanging out with you and teaching. I am actually going to be taking on a full-time position over at a nature center nearby in Philadelphia for a little bit. And so um, I will be still teaching out school, but it will only be kind of after 5 p.m. Eastern. It's not going to affect these classes because these are late night classes anyway, so I can work and do these at the same time. Um, and they've agreed to let me continue doing my Insectopia stuff, so that's exciting for me. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Yes. Um, I super appreciate all of you guys coming and hanging out with me and doing, um, and, and, you know, you guys help me do what I love. And so I, uh, I definitely am looking forward to continuing to do this. Oh, guess what? Congratulations to all of us. Um, last week sometime when I was in Arizona, I got the official email from YouTube saying that I broke 100,000 views. Um, so we are pretty excited about that. Um, I wouldn't be here without my nature journaling buddies. Um, if you have not already subscribed to my channel, this is your reminder to do so. Um, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I do things other than the live stream too every now and again. Actually, I have a good number of insects that I need to pin up from my collection, including a brand new tarantula hawk that might be coming to a live stream near you. Um, oh, and I caused these really beautiful jewel, like, I, we have some really cool beetles to sketch once I get them all pinned up. So we're about to open up a whole new realm of possibilities. Um, 
let's see so there's that i do like to post pictures on facebook and on instagram i haven't been doing guess that bug as regularly just because it takes so long to take the microscope images and i've been spending so much time outside i figured i could do go get back in to guess that bug when um when it's winter time and when i'm mostly working on the microscope rather than going out and collecting bugs and you know following the emergence um, yes, a tarantula hawk, let's sketch that. Yeah, I think that everyone is going to love that one. And right about here, this is my QR code. It's where you can send me just a couple of dollars if you've really enjoyed spending time with me, if you've learned something, um, if you've been here for over an hour with me. Thank you, right? I think that um, I love it when, when we have a large number of people that stay for over an hour. That means we have a group, a good, you know, group of des um, of um, de dedicated is the word I'm looking for, um, dedicated people out there and um, that also want to talk bugs with me. And so I need this outlet. <laughs> I need to be able to talk to bugs about bugs with people. So thank you for doing that with me. And if you enjoy it as much as I do, you can go ahead and support me so that um, I can continue doing this. Um, you can go ahead and post your images on Instagram or on Facebook, just make sure you tag me at Insectopia2015 so that I see them too, because I love to love and share other people's sketches. Whew. All right. Look at that. I think we are all good. We are at a thousand watch hours out of 4,000 watch hours that we need for an entire year. So we're about 25% of the way there from YouTube actually supporting me. So we're a quarter of the way there. <laughs> we just need to continue to spread the word and spread the love. So um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your night. I think I'm about to be signing off. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to introduce to you new insects that I'm adding into my collection. Maybe I'll create some type of post. Maybe you all should be following my Facebook page, and then I can post more regularly on my Facebook We'll see. All right. So thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. I will be back on Sunday, but then I will be gone for another two weeks because I am traveling to Michigan. Two weeks? Yeah. I'm going to be gone for the next two weeks. I will be back August 25th. All right. And I look forward to seeing you then or this Sunday. Um, and stay buggy. I could do polls on Facebook. Yeah, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna be traveling Michigan with a black light, with my new black light, and I'm really excited about that. So yes, August 25th, I will be back, and then I don't think I have any plans after that for most of the year until, what, Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday, so I might not be live streaming on Thanksgiving Day. Um... Thank you. I will hopefully be finishing Ant Hill so then I can talk to you all about how I felt about it and all of the stuff. So looking forward to that. Stay buggy and I will see you in about two weeks. Bye.